They're the diets with the low environmental impacts which contribute to food and, and nutrition security and healthy life for present and future generations. They're protective and respectful of biodiversity and ecosystems, culturally acceptable, accessible, economically fair, affordable, safe and healthy while optimi optimising natural and human resources. So whilst a temperature rise is inevitable, the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, has proposed a safe limit for global warming increase to no more than 1.5 degrees centigrade by 2050. So if we're to prevent catastrophic consequences for extreme weather conditions, a significant reduction of 70 to 90 percent is needed to keep this temperature rise below 1.5 percent. And as the food system is responsible for as much as 30 percent of all global greenhouse gas emissions, it's clear this needs to change. In October 2018, The Lancet published the latest findings from the Global Burden of Disease Study, which said almost one out of every six deaths were due to poor dietary habits. The biggest disease burden is obesity, with almost two-thirds of the adult population overweight or obese, and a quarter to over a third of children aged 2 to 11 overweight or obese. And the result is an explosion of non-communicative diseases, which are driving the NHS and our economy to destruction. So this is, the obesity has led to a five-fold increase in diabetes and an increase of 28% in heart disease. And this is costing the NHS almost six billion a year and almost 30 billion to the overall economy, so it's huge. If we can improve our diets by addressing climate change, it, will also it might also help with health concerns, it's a win-win situation. So our food systems are damaging the planet. From farm to fork to waste, each stage has environmental impacts. Farming and manufacturing processes are, and the way we eat and dispose of food are damaging the planet. Taking into consideration farming, production, distribution, delivery through to, through to our waste, our current food system contributes 18 to 25% of global greenhouse gas emissions in the UK and 20 to 30% globally. It's a leading cause of deforestation, biodiversity loss, and soil and water pollution around the world. It accounts for 70% of all human water use. In addition, 10 million tonnes of all food produced is spoiled or wasted in the UK yearly. Overfishing and poor fishing practices have impacted on fishing stocks with 85% of fisheries fully exploited. Agriculture and livestock farming are by far the biggest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, deforestation, biodiversity loss, soil pollution, and land and water use. So as the population grows from current 7 billion to an estimated 9 to 10 billion by 2050, the demand for food will grow, which means more greenhouse gas emissions, more depletion of natural resources. And other environmental factors are just as important for the security of food, including there's also like degradation of soil, water supply for crop growth, and ecosystem and biodiversity, and that's insects and other invertebrates which are needed for pollination. Um, and pest control, soil quality, changes in temperature, uh, season patterns, and rainfall have consequences for insects and vertebrae, which provide a vital agricultural ecosystem. Can you eat sustainably and healthily in the UK? So the 2016 Eat Well Guide, which you probably recognise, the, the review of the government dietary recommendations incorporated sustainable factors for the first time, whilst also aiming to ensure that it met nutritional needs. So possibly the most notable change is the clear focus on plant-based proteins instead of meat, with a subheading to eat more beans and pulses, and then also limit red meat, reduce dairy by a third, and remove foods high in fat, salt and sugar, ensure fruit and veg and starchy foods are the biggest part of the guide. So dietary recommendations for sustainable diets. So this is the Eat Lancet recommendations, <coughs> published in 2019. Um, the Lancet report is one of the biggest studies into sustainable diets in recent years. The commission is made up of 37 experts <coughs> in 16 countries. 
The recommendations are based on 2,500 calories a day with the opportunity for countries to modify. On a global average, the recommendations would help reduce individual in energy intake by 300 calories a day. What's important to note is that there's a significant range of recommendations per food group, which enables countries to adapt to fit their national guidelines. So some countries may need to reduce their meat consumption, like Mexico, which needs to significantly reduce its meat consumption, and some might need to increase their meat consumption, such as in sub-Saharan Africa. So the report highlights that a healthy, sustainable diet can be achieved whether one continues to have meat and dairy or follows a vegan or vegetarian diet. So it recommends that over half of the intake is fruit and veg. With regard to carbs, it recommends whole grains are prioritized over tubers and starchy veg. And this evidence is taken from a US cohort study which found that the, the more refined carbohydrate, a, a bigger, the, the bigger the intake of refined carbohydrates, increases the risk of total mortality. So this also dairy is reduced in, and sugar recommended no more than 31 grams per adult per day, which is in line with the UK recommendations. So if you look at this, how do we assess sustainability in food? It, this is a complex subject because there's many different factors at play. So on this slide, is a, it's an explanation of how the impact of protein sources are commonly assessed. But other factors include also biodiversity, ecosystems, soil degradation, pesticide use, and overfishing. So whilst most publications investigate greenhouse gas emissions, this study looks at land and water use to give a better picture of the impact of protein food sources on sustainability of the planet. So it looked at mean greenhouse gas emissions, water and land use values of different foods to produce 100 grams of protein. There are, these are, there are average base, um, values based on a combination of data sets from around the world, which means significant variability depending on country of origin, farming practices, dry or wet weather conditions, transportation, greenhouse use, etc. So it's interesting looking at the water stress use because that considers several aspects water, including water scarcity and quality, and accessibility. So other, in other words, some of the water would be taken from that needed for human consumption. Therefore, a product with a high stress-weighted water use implies it's using water meant for storage, which could be used for irrigation in dry conditions, and it could be used for human consumption, and where possibly water is already scarce. So what's interesting to note is that water doesn't always correlate with the amount of greenhouse gas emissions. For example, although nuts have got the lowest greenhouse gas emissions, 100 grams of protein, they use the most water because they're grown in areas with scarce water. So land use is also significant as it's land that might otherwise be used to more efficiently produce protein from another source or land that could be forested and therefore have a competitive impact on global greenhouse emissions. BDA is the British Dietetic Association, and this is their diet recommendations. So basically, kind of a bit what I've said, reproduction in red meat, an increase, now I need to take my glasses off, <laughs> an increase in plant proteins, and prioritise beans and lentils. Fish is using sort of sustainable fish from the accredited places. Reduction in dairy and using plant-based milk instead, where available, in terms of starch, an increase in whole grain, and fruit and veg, increase in fruit and veg, but with the caveat that if it's air freighted, prepackaged, growing greenhouses, then not so good. Reduction, again, in that, a ban on high fat, salt and sugar foods, reduction in juices, sweet drinks, cans of coke and that sort of thing, reduction in food waste. So to eat more sustainably, it's important to remember that meat doesn't have to be emitted but reduced and processed meat should be avoided. Although it's got less protein in it, it's got a more rounded nutritional profile, especially complex carbohydrates, which contain a lot of fiber and minerals. And it contains all the essential amino acids, so even a diet based purely on plants will meet the energy requirements and contain all your essential amino acids. Reducing food waste is important because uneaten food has no nutritional value and significant environmental impact. Individual households have the biggest role to play in this. So fruit and veg, which are perishable, are the biggest contributors to household waste. But it's a complex message to give the public because we don't want to discourage fruit and veg intake. So the message has to be waste less, buy tinned, frozen, and use leftovers in soups, stews, etc. 
It's also really expensive. A typical household is spending £470 a year on food, which is then thrown away. And this figure is even higher in families with children. So a sustainable diet, as I said before, doesn't have to be vegan or vegetarian, but if consumed with variety and in a balanced ways, these diets can meet all the micronutrient requirements, with the exception of vegans who do need B12. As many of us are already over-consuming protein, even vegetarians and vegans, moving to a plant-based food source shouldn't be an issue. Although we get less iron from plant sources, it's less bioavailable, it's interesting, there was a study done over 12 weeks which, which showed that the body adapts. There was an increased absorption of over 40% of iron. So non-dairy foods like dark green veg can contribute up to 400 milligrams of calcium. So it's going some way to meeting our requirements. And then you've got nuts and seeds, and also flour because it's fortified, along with other white flour-based goods. And then you've got zinc, which is a source of vitamin B12. Okay.